Hello, everybody, and thank you for watching our second day of ETS 2021. I'm Joyce Bowie, Senior Research Analyst here at Z Prime. I'm very excited about this panel, The Climate Urgency of Now. Here with us today is uh, Jan Brenz, Global Energy Sustainability and Infrastructure Segment Leader for Guidehouse, and Kevin Walker, President and CEO of Duquesne Light. Kevin and Jan, how are you doing today? Well, Joyce, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Doing well and uh, happy to be back here, Joyce. This is a this is a yearly uh, in, uh, you know exciting event for uh, for all of us. So uh, can't wait for the discussion. Yeah, no, I mean, so today we're going to be talking about how utilities can usher in the climate action era to unlock social and economic opportunities for their communities, as well as to address the greatest challenge of our times. Um, you know, before we get started, though, just a reminder to the audience, please drop your questions into the chat. You know, we want to make sure that Jan and Kevin have access to your thoughts so that way we can engage with you and make sure we get your questions answered. And with that, we'll get started. Um, so utilities throughout the world have made commitments to decarbonize and have taken a proactive approach to addressing climate change. What makes the utilities so equipped to lead within the climate action era? Jan, you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I think there's the obvious answer, right? 20% uh, of emissions in the US are coming from power generation. Um, um, it might be actually a little less because I think 25% was, you know, a few years ago. So, you know, we, utilities have an important role to, to, you know, handle that part of, of carbon emissions. Um, it's, it's actually quite interesting that today, I didn't realize that, but 40% of uh, 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 our electricity comes from clean um, uh, carbon-free uh, uh, sources today. Um, obviously, that includes uh, nuclear and, and uh, hydro as well, uh, beyond wind and solar, but 40% is already carbon-free. And then, you know, the EEI members collectively have set a target of 80% reduction by 2050 compared to baseline of, of 2005. So, so all, you know, really good things. Um, and um, what's even more exciting is that 75% uh, of utility customers uh, are served by a utility um, or their parent that has committed to 100% carbon free targets, um, whether that's 2050 or 2030. I think this will further evolve. Um, and I think it's really uh, good to see how the industry is stepping up to handle that, that part of the, uh, of the equation. Um, now, what, what is really important is that utilities also play a role in decarbonizing the other parts um, of, um, um, of, of, the, of the pie, if you will. So when you talk about uh, transportation, which is the biggest uh, uh, piece still, when you talk about industry, when you talk about buildings, uh, and, and, and even, you know, agriculture to, to some, some extent. So as the energy system evolves in, in what we call the energy cloud, and Joyce, you've heard me talk about the energy cloud, which is really mm. a, a system of systems, including transportation systems, into, including systems around, you know, building uh, uh, connectivity and decarbonization, I think utilities have a really important role to to, to look at those parts of, of our carbon emissions and, and see how they can work with their clients to reduce those parts of the, of the, of the pie as well. So I, I think utilities you know, uh, are tasked with helping you know, reduce carbon emissions across all of these sectors and not only you know, the power generation side, which is the obvious one. Great, thank you so much. And Kevin, you know, how do you feel about you know, what makes utilities so equipped to lead within this era? Yeah, Jan gave such a great answer. I can just say, yeah, what he said. But, but I mean, it's exactly right. I mean, we utilities are not you know new at this game. I mean, we we've started this journey uh, you know well before um, now and uh, have had great successes with um, you know decarbonizing our generation fleet. Right. So we used to be vertically integrated. Now we've are, you know kind of unbundled those things. Most most utilities have, but uh, still the focus has been on um, you know making sure that we have a clean generation fleet. And so that success is showing up now, uh, you know, to uh, Jan's point about 20% you know, ish, uh, where it used to be much higher from a generation source. So the other, other couple of sources is, is mobile, as he mentioned, transportation, uh, and the utilities have the know-how, the connectivity, the ability to make sure that the grid uh, with these variable sources that are in and out, uh, the sun shining and not shining, and uh, the wind blowing and not blowing and, you know, uh, vehicles are charging and then discharging um, with that variability, the utilities is the glue that makes sure all that stuff works together from a reliable, resilient, uh, safe way. So, um, you know, lots of roles for the utilities to play. Uh, I'm proud to say that we've uh, we've done our part and we'll continue to do our part. 
And we also facilitate those other, um, both transportation and buildings, as Jan mentioned, um, to, to green up and, and help, the, help the climate. Excellent, thank you. So, you know, we understand that utilities can't do this alone, right? Even if they are primed to be really efficient or um, effective leaders within this era, we can't do it alone. So Kevin, what role does cross-sector collaboration play in this environment? Yeah, I mean, it's critical. I mean, I, I you know, started mentioning it a little bit is that, uh, you know, as the connector from a utilities role, uh, you know, somebody has a new technology that is uh, green in nature, either on the customer side, so we call it behind the meter, in front of the meter, in between the utility and the customer or at the utility level, um, there's a um, choreography for lack of a better term that has to happen for all that stuff to fit well together. Um, the value proposition has to be there um, you know, from a business model. Um, the uh, technical solution has to be there and it has to integrate with all the other technical solutions uh, there. There has to be a regulatory uh, piece of it that makes it all work. Uh, customer adoption um, is a piece of that, and, and the utilities are squarely uh, in those spaces already. And so it's easy to leverage the path that's already blazed versus trying to create a new path. Uh, and I think that that's really the um, collaboration that's going to have to happen in order for all these things to you know, meet, their, meet their moment, meet their time, uh, and, and to really add value to this uh, climate uh, effort that we're all uh, undertaking here. That's really so, so important. I think this segment is really critical and uh, that collaboration uh, can't be uh, overestimated. Thank you. Jan. Yeah, I, I think, I think as I mentioned before, in this energy cloud world, um, uh, things have to be connected. Uh, so, so, you know, some argue that, you know, utilities role is, is the connector. And I think Paula Gold Williams even spoke about that on the, on, on the previous session. Uh, we, we talk about orchestration um, because we cannot invest in um, uh, new products and services and, and greener solutions if we're not able to integrate those resources into the larger grid. Um, again, the, the grid is not anymore just about generation, transmission and distribution. There's a lot of distributed energy resources that are coming onto the grid at a much faster pace than central station uh, generation capacity, uh, by the way, in the next five to 10 years. So the utility really has that role of orchestrating all those resources to optimize um, not only you know, things like reliability and safety and affordability, which is still very important, also, of course, cost, but also to orchestrate that our resources are becoming cleaner, that our resources are more flexible, that our resources are more resilient at the same time. And, and you know, predictability, I will throw it out there, right? What we've seen in Texas, uh, that's not what customers want to deal with. You know, having a predictable uh, a service at a, at, a, at a predictable price is very important. So, so that's why the role of the utilities as that orchestrator, where you really maximize, um, you know, both what's, what's in front of the meter as well as what's behind of the meter to the benefit of individual customers, but then also the larger, you know, ecosystem of, of users on that grid. Um, uh, that's really the role of the, of the, of the utility being that orchestrator. Yeah, and I think the discussion we're having here, Joyce, is about the traditional utility. I mean, we have the luxury of Duquesne Light to have mm -hmm. uh, some uh, affiliates that are non-traditional. So we have a telecom uh, company and we have a energy efficiency company. So uh, on one side, we are the orchestrator connector. On the other side, we actually are providing the, you know, the products and services that will uh, be needed going forward. So we have the opportunity to see how that all fits uh, and how we can best leverage our you know, people process and technology to deliver on behalf of a, a larger customer base. So it's kind of exciting being able to play in all those spaces. Yeah, and and, and by the way, um, and, and Kevin knows that, the Joyce, we have to make a lot of changes. I mean, you know, we need to adapt a different regulatory construct. We need to look for different engagement models with customers and different business models as well. So, uh, you know, again, a, a lot of work to be done, but I think I think where this is going is very clear. The pace at which, and 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 exactly how we implement some of these uh, 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 new products and services or some of these new business models. That's, I think, what we're, what we're really working on, hard on as an industry. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Um, it's definitely an exciting time, but there is a lot in front of us, um, as you mentioned, but uh, it's a good direction to be taking, that's for sure. To switch gears a little bit, you know, uh, aging infrastructure or the need to establish more digital infrastructure is really clear. Um, so how do utilities juggle infrastructure planning needs of the future 
you know, in a rapidly changing world where say like the historical models that they used to use uh, to see whether or not the grid was hardened or they needed to weatherize or whatever um, doesn't really work anymore because of the climate change. Um, Jan, how do they deal with this? Yeah, I, I get the question, um, you know, uh, a lot about in terms of timing. Um, and, and what I said before uh, is also true for, you know, planning horizons, investment horizons, and, and strategy horizons, right? In, in, you know, so far utilities um, have, you know, strategic plans, five year. Um, they look at financial forecasts for their investors, you know, in the same three to five year uh, uh, time range. But then they're making investment decisions, uh, you know, uh, for 30 plus years, right? Um, uh, uh, and and I, I think what's really, really um, important for utilities right now is to, to look at that gap in terms of, um, um, uh, you know, not the next weather event or this summer or this winter, you know, what does it do in terms of demand? What does it do in terms of potential weather events that we need to um, uh, prepare for, right? Uh, the storm preparedness, uh, wildfire preparedness, things like that. But really think about the next decades, the next two, three, four decades from an overall climate change perspective. What does it do to our business? Um, um, and, and I think taking that view is, is challenging because it's not easy. You can't predict the weather 30 years from now, but you can uh, actually look at uh, long-term climate impacts uh, in terms of um, uh, infrastructure, investments, locations, um, as, as well as you know, energy usage and what type of products and services, uh, you know, will, will utilities need to be uh, able to support uh, at, at, this, at this moment? So it, 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 the hard thing of the energy transition is it's not an overnight change. It's not from today to tomorrow, but it's also not a 30 year change. It, it's somewhere, you know, in the, in, the, in the, you know, six to 12 year range where things really will change significantly, which makes it, you know, uh, hard for utilities to, to predict that. But a uh, longer term view, um, and then look at what, you know, what business models and, and regulatory models would look like, you know, six to 12 years from now would be, uh, would be my advice. Um, Great. Thank Joyce, you. I would, yeah, Joyce, sorry, I, I would say, um, you know, the uh, a different summary of your question is like, how do you plan for the future where things that used to be more predictable are not as predictable anymore? There's a lot of unknown factors and variables that go into that planning. And, um, you know, that is the situation that we find ourselves in. And, you know, when you, when you do that, um, you have to think about, um, you know, doing things that are very flexible, that are agile, that are, you know, nimble and able to adjust and shift uh, if some of those variables, uh, you know, come to fruition faster than you think or slower than you think or even not at all, for instance. And so how do you, how do you uh, build something that has that flexibility and, and, and can be responsive to those changes? Uh, Another thing we do is, is you know, we used, we used to look at the past to predict the future, and we looked into the long-term past. So we would look at, you know, 10-year weather patterns, 15-year weather patterns. Uh, well, those are not really indicative. If you look at, like, the last five years, very different weather patterns. Um, and, you know, it gets diluted if you start looking at a 15-year window. So we're starting to shorten up those, those predictors so that we get uh, more currency uh, in, as in current uh, information uh, so that we can forecast that forward. And it gives us you know, very different um, results going forward. And so that, that resiliency, that hardening for a climate that is absolutely changing. I think the you know, um, you know, climate change, the word is uh, supercharged with a lot, of, you know, uh, you know, a lot of negative and positive things. So let's, let's put the, the term aside. We certainly know that you know, both anecdotally and through uh, scientific data, that weather patterns are changing and they're changing to be more severe, more frequent. Uh, I was just visiting um, uh, Colorado recently for an EI conference and, you know, we used to live in, in Colorado and remember, you know, the, the thin air and the blue skies. And uh, when I was there, I, I could see this haze for three or the four days I was there and it was wildfire impacts from California that were coming into Colorado. So I had never experienced that before. Um, and that's part of what's happening from a climate change uh, scenario. So a lot of work to do and, and very careful about not looking at long-term history to predict the future because it's, it's not aligned uh, anymore. That's a great point. Yeah, I mean, you're both touching on some really great points here. Um, to shift gears a little bit and to touch on some things that you guys have kind of already mentioned, right, is the changing customer relationship. So as the utility customer relationship matures or continues to evolve, you know, initially it was for meters, now we're talking about prosumers. 
Um, how are the utility business models changing to keep up? Jan? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll let Kevin talk about, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the things that they're doing like right now in terms of looking at certain business models. Uh, it's definitely around new products and services. Um, I, I want to I want to go one step further, and then maybe we can go back to Kevin to 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 talk about what's happening like right now. Um, beyond you know energy products and services, uh, which is definitely right now uh, uh, what utilities are thinking about and and, and clients are asking for. Um, I actually think that utilities play a really key role um, in how their clients change their operations. Um, and what I mean by operations, core operations, uh, supply chain, logistics, warehousing, uh, production processes. Um, all these companies, uh, and, and we, just, we just published a white paper um, on our website that talks about the elements that you know, large corporations are looking at from a circularity perspective, from a connected, connectedness per perspective, transparency, operational efficiency, resiliency, and social equity, right? They are need to design their operational uh, operations in, in line with all these um, uh, elements. And uh, I actually think that energy is so key to production process from a carbon perspective, to logistic processes from a transportation perspective, that utilities will get more engaged in, in, in the core processes of their clients, which is kind of, you know, um, people say, well, that's not really, you know, the, the job of a utility. But again, as the orchestrator, uh, utilities will need to understand their clients' businesses uh, even better and how they can then help them decarbonize their businesses. So this is not about only about utilities decarbonizing their own operations and their generation uh, 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 assets, but this is also how utilities can help their clients decarbonizing uh, beyond you know some of the obvious things like energy efficiency or even you know EV charging, hardcore operations um, uh, 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 as well as going into buildings or residentials. I think that's what we will see again. You know. Uh, Three, five, you know, eight years from now. Yeah, Jan, your your answer is spot on. It touches on two concepts that you know we're focused on at Duquesne Light. One is our ESG, um, you know, progress. You know how we're uh, showing up from an environmental standpoint, our governance and sustainability, and that includes diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and it includes like uh, how we show up in our communities, how we're um, you know bringing everyone forward to the clean energy future, uh, not just the those who uh, potentially can afford. Uh, some additional costs, the, the privilege of, of uh, clean energy. We want to make sure that's not a privilege, but, you know, gets close to a right for everyone to be able to access that. So that, you know, part of what you said, you know, kind of harkens to our ESG strategy. And then the other piece about how we show up for our customers uh, beyond our, our, you know, our core business of safe, reliable, affordable um, energy uh, is uh, what we call a move to being a trusted energy partner. So it goes beyond uh, just those things that are really critical and have been our traditional role with our customers. But you know, how do we understand their business better, help them to make both energy choices and energy related choices? Um, you know, we want customers when they think about these decisions to say, you know, I have a, a, you know, a trusted uh, support uh, system in our utility company in Duquesne Light where we could actually ask them what their thoughts are and they're going to be able to bring a lot of their wisdom and experience and their connection to um, you know, the emerging technologies and help us you know, solve our problems you know, from an inside out standpoint, understanding our business versus from an outside in uh, standpoint. So you know, that's a journey that we're on to, you know, and you have to earn that. I mean, it's great to you know, put a sticker and say we're open for business, but uh, people have to trust and believe that you can provide that and you have their best interest uh, when you're doing that. And so that's uh, what we're trying to accomplish with our customers to have this deeper um, relationship, a trusting relationship to be this trusted energy partner. Yeah, no, both of you are making some pretty fantastic points. Um, we did have a question come in from the audience, which is, and thank you for asking, Brian, um, how do you communicate to an average customer the importance of things that utilities are doing to address climate related challenges? Is it bill impacts or reliability? Kevin, you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And um, the first thing that pops in mind is customer segmentation, because you just said a cust uh, average customer. And we do have many average customers who uh, I call it the easy button. They just want the easy button. Um, I say they, it could be me. I just, I like the easy button. Um, you know, the details of why and how and how much and all of those things are not as important uh, for this type of customer when you think about the segmentation. They just want to understand 
you know, am I better off today than I was tomorrow? Are you doing things in my interest or, or against my interest? You know, am I, am I optimizing my portfolio? It kind of goes back into the trusted energy partner because if they trust you, then it's like oftentimes they'll, they'll say, hey, you just handle this for me. Um, give me, you know, some insights on how well you're doing. So like, you know, if we didn't intervene, you would have paid this much, but because we intervened, you paid this much. Or if you, if we didn't intervene, you would have had this sort of reliability because we intervened, you had this sort of reliability. So I say, keep it simple for those customers, find out what the critical important things are for them. And then, you know, show them those things and continue to build that trust where um, it's easy. They have confidence that's being taken care of. They have substantive, um, indicators that show that that's happening. Um, and, and then I think that you'll meet uh, or exceed their expectations. Obviously, if you move through customer seg segmentation, we have other customers who uh, want to know all the details. They want to understand you know, why we're putting a uh, you know, new substation in a location versus you know, thinking about a microgrid or doing something else. And, so, and, they, and they understand all those details. And you know, those are usually our, our larger commercial customers and industrial customers. Who are all over the you know the clean energy future, uh, and we have to show up for them in a different way. But for that average customer, I would say keep it simple. Make sure we understand what's important to them, uh, earn their trust, so that we can do it on their behalf, and it takes a burden off of them, so they can focus on other things that are important in their lives. Great, thank you, Jan. Do you have anything to add? No, I think I think I think Kevin handled it. I, I think that customer segmentation over time will even lead to, um, you know, almost um, uh, the ability of utilities to engage at the individual level, right? I, they're doing that already with, with, with C&I customers, but even at the um, uh, residential level, I think we're going to, you're going to see uh, more of that as well, where they just know that, you know, uh, Jan and his family during the day, they're not at home. So, you know, reliability is not an important um, outside COVID, of course, uh, uh, post uh, pre and post COVID. And, and really customize you know, offerings. Um, a good model to do it is subscription model. Um, I sign up for a certain package where I get exactly the service and the service levels as Kevin referred to that, that, are, you know, that, that meet my needs. Uh, I think we're gonna see more of that as well. Awesome, thank you. So you know, when we talk about climate urgency and the impacts of climate urgency, we're not just talking about weather. You know, there's a real measurable health impact to climate change. So how do utilities ensure accessibility of services as renewables become more prevalent on the grid? Kevin, you wanna take that one? Yeah, I mean, I, the health piece of it, I'll, I'll touch on. And I mentioned, you know, the, the bad air quality in Colorado. I mean, uh, you know, folks who have uh, underlying conditions that uh, have to do with respiratory things. I mean, it was not just a visible uh, inconvenience, it was a potential threat to their health. And so, these climate impacts uh, go beyond, to your point, the resiliency of the grid or um, making sure people are comfortable uh, from a temperature standpoint. It, you know, it could have you know, life-threatening uh, or altering uh, impacts. So uh, it's, really, it's really important. And um, you know, to, to the point of, you know, and I, I look at you know, the renewables as clean, but also variable. That's, that's really the, the, the piece as you're thinking about fitting it to the grid. Uh, it's things that are not steady, Eddie, that are there all the time that you can rely on. Uh, you want to use them when they're plentiful and, ma and maximize it. But when they're not, you've got to have some other al alternative way to, to deliver uh, those power, that power. Coming from California, you know, the duck curve is legendary where, you know, during the day where there's plenty of sun and plenty of wind, you've got like an oversupply of clean energy. Um, but as soon as the sun goes down and the wind stops blowing, you get this, this trough that you have to fill with something. And so I think it's an, an all of the above strategy. I think that's an over, overused cliche, but um, in the terms that I mean it is that, you know, until we get to a place where we have battery technology that has long standing storage capability uh, that, you know, acts like a base load, you know, gas fire plant, um, you know, when we need it, um, you know, we need a gas fired plant to fill those, to fill those, uh, those vacancies. So um, it is all the above strategy. I, I, I had a, a very, uh, you know, promising discussion with a battery company just uh, two days ago. And I was like, wow, if they can do what they said they're going to do, and they can proliferate that in the commercial market. I mean, that's a game changer for being able to really, you know, start to get um, almost exclusively focused on, um, on clean energy sources, but, but it's still, you know, a ways away. So there's an interim step that we have to focus on. Uh, long term, we're going to get to a place where you know we can really do that uh, almost holistically around the clock. Jan, 
Yeah, I, I, I see, we see great examples of, of how utilities, not only providing clean energy, but also um, uh, uh, supporting underserved communities uh, and, 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 and work on uh, uh, social equity at the same time. Uh, city of Denver, we did a project for City of Denver that looked at electrification of transportation for underserved neighborhoods, right? So ride sharing, but also public transportation that is clean and helps underserved com communities. Same in Massachusetts. Uh, and, and I know, you know, Kevin's organization does a lot around energy efficiency, but how can we, you know, create energy efficiency programs that also serve uh, uh, underserved communities and offer jobs to, you know, uh, people in those communities as well? Um, it, it was very interesting. Uh, this morning, I read an article um, uh, from the LinkedIn founder, Alan Blue, and uh, pretty amazing. Um, uh, they are saying that um, uh, from their perspective, uh, they, they distinguish green jobs from green skills. Um, there will be 24 million new jobs, new clean green jobs created by 2030. So that's an enormous amount of, of new jobs. And there's discussion in the US about, you know, uh, how, how much jobs the infrastructure um, uh, uh, plan creates, et cetera. But then they're talking about green skills. And, and their, their statement was that 50% of all existing jobs will change because of green skills. Isn't that a, you know amazing number? And, and isn't that a great opportunity to really look at our, you know, at our workforce and look at you know, equity and, and look at underserved communities and, 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 and people and see how we can you know, uh, uh, help them develop skills and train them uh, in either in green skills or complete green jobs. I think that's the opportunity for the industry and that's where equity um, and that's where, you know, the, the, the critical social role of utilities uh, comes comes in play as well. It's going to be really impactful um, uh, and, and, and I'm excited about it. Yeah, no, I mean, it is an exciting time and it's definitely an important endeavor to make sure that no one gets left behind um, in this. And it is a difficult task, but it's definitely worthwhile to pursue. Um, I just have one final question for you gentlemen, which I think is probably the biggest question of all. Uh, why now? Like, where is this urgency coming from? Uh, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, you, you can find uh, reasonable people who uh, believe on both sides of the equation that, you know, we're past the time, uh, you know, we're treading water and we need to make up some ground because we, we haven't done what we need to do as a planet, you know, as a, as a country, as an industry. And there's others who say, you know, yeah, you know, these are, these are cyclical and, you know, climate change will come and go. And, you know, we, we probably are overblowing it. Um, you know, I would say both anecdotally and through scientific fact, um, you know, we see the climate is is changing and creating more of an impact on our systems. And we talked about, you know, uh, what happened in Texas and you know derechos and nor'easters and Hurricane Sandy. I mean, you can you could name lots of these things in our lifetime. They used to be, you know, a hundred year events that are happening on a much more frequent basis. Uh, the hurricane season that we happen to be in. You know, it's already spinning off more hurricanes than we typically have seen, uh, you know, in the past. So, um, you know, there are, again, anecdotal and factual. I, I'll talk about Pennsylvania. I mean, every utility in Pennsylvania, um, its reliability indices are, are worse this year than last year. Last year was worse than the year before. And it's because of the impacts of uh, weather. Uh, for us, it's, you know, high winds. Um, you know, we used to clock, you know, sustained winds at, anywhere from you know 30 to 40 mile an hour um you know i joined a year ago and you know, we had you know a 60 mile an hour uh, sustained winds that you know really wreaks havoc on a system that was not designed for that um you know rain when we have heavy rain it uproots a lot of the trees we're a highly foliated uh, region of the country and so that that water getting into the roots causes problems so it's there both anecdotally and scientifically and we just really need to respond to it Great, thank you, Jan. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Kevin. Um, you can look at you know rising sea levels. You can look at average temperatures. You can look at the ozone layer. Uh, the stat that I really like um, and, and I use a lot um, it comes from the National Oceanic and, and Atmospheric Administration (NOAA), um, uh, and and this is a pretty amazing stat. Every time I look at it, um, in the last they, they track these um, what they call one billion dollar events. These are events that that uh, a hurricane, wildfire, uh, a flood. That cause over a billion dollar of damage uh, to um, you know to to a region, and they're tracking them uh, year over year. 
in the last 30 years in the US, we had on average seven of those events a year. Uh, again, hurricane, wildfires, uh, winter storm, seven a year. In the last five years, that average has gone up to 15 uh, a year in the last five years. That says it all. We, we have to, we have to you know, adapt. Um, we have to think about resiliency. We have to think about you know, flood zones. We have to uh, uh, think about impact on uh, you know, transmission systems and distribution systems. Um, and, and we have to address global warming. Um, um, the facts are clear. No, absolutely. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time today. I think that this was a very fruitful discussion. We covered a lot of topics, but definitely important ones, that's for sure. Um, looking forward to the next time we get to collaborate together. Up next, we have Consumer Enlightenment and the Curiosity Uproar. Uh, Jason Rodriguez is going to be moderating with a whole bunch of really phenomenal people. Hoping for, looking forward to you guys sticking around for that. Um, with that, I hope everyone has a really good rest of your day. Thank, Thank you, Joyce. You too. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.